The spies messed up. Tzlovchad violated Shabbat and messed up. Parashat Shlach is full of lessons. And Hashem tells us that not having emunah is not just a bad thing, it's a disaster. In fact, Yeshua ben Nun and Kalev ben Yifunek compared it to death. But what's so bad about lacking an emuna? And in fact, how do we know if we have it? How do we know if we have bitachon? How do we know the difference? Tonight you're going to learn some of the most critical and fundamental lessons about how to have an amazing life and how to avoid the opposite. This is perhaps one of the most powerful lectures I've ever been a part of when it has to do with this particular subject. And it's certainly something that gave me chizuk, and I know you're going to enjoy it. In fact, one of the people online actually said they're crying as a result of listening to this you. Enjoy it, share it, and be holy. We're uh, back on our Wednesday night uh, program where we have uh, the uh, Stump the Rabbi series, our longest standing series. We're after some Divrei Torah, which I am uh, certain you guys are going to uh, enjoy. Bezal Hashem, the Divrei Lokim Chaim Bezal Hashem are always enjoyable. Uh, the words of the living God are always enjoyable. Uh, Hashem's uh, holy Torah is uh, as delicious as ever. And uh, after that, you guys could ask some questions. Bezal Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will give us the answers. Uh, so tonight's show will be for the Refuah uh, Shlema. For uh, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana bat Sara, uh, Avi Mori David ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris bat Jora, um, uh, Sara bat uh, Esther, and all of Am Israel and all the righteous Noahides that continue to contribute, continue to watch our shiurim, continue to do as much as they possibly can for the sake of Am Israel, for the sake of our holy Torah, for the sake of our connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So uh, with that being said, uh, good news for me. I uh, got my uh, personal delivery of uh, the books, Baruch Hashem, and the new Kiruv cards. Uh, the shipment, we have the uh, uh, stuff in Israel, stuff in uh, New York. Now we have in Florida. So Baruch Hashem got lots of stuff that uh, we're distributing. We've already distributed uh, somewhere around 15,000 books. I think even more than 15,000 books. Uh, of my new book, Baruch Hashem, in Eretz Yisrael, and uh, we're already distributing hundreds of books uh, in uh, the United States, and uh, Baruch Hashem, the Ora Levana is here, Baruch Hashem. Uh, it's pretty, it's got even uh, nicer things inside, it has a very uh, cool uh, ribbon with Bezat Hashem logo on it, so Baruch Hashem, these are available on the uh, Kiruv store, uh, for you to distribute, anyone that wants to get a box of 20 or more books to distribute, uh, you know, in their community, can go to kiruvstore.org, kiruvstore.org. You can also donate uh, over there as well. Uh, kiruvstore.org, you get this uh, 20 box, uh, 20 copies of it. For people that want individual copies, uh, right now, I'm not ready for it yet. Uh, just too busy with a lot of other stuff. Uh, when I'm ready for it, I'll try to take care of some of the personal requests that people have. We're going to try to put it on Amazon so Amazon can take care of some of the shipment and stuff like that and cost of it. It just uh, takes a lot of time. And uh, uh, so we'll uh, do the individual copies uh, later on. Uh, anyone that wants, uh, you know, copies should commit to, the, you know, to, con uh, to um, contributing a little bit by distributing 20 copies in their community or more. Uh, aside from that, my uh, new uh, cards, the new cards are, uh, are in. Uh, as I told you guys, they're very, very cool. Uh, if you remember, the uh, old cards, uh, which we actually also have some of these on the way as well, but uh, the old cards looked like this. You know, this was Tikkun Abrit on one side, and you had the uh, Shem took back his millions on, uh, on the other side in very, uh, you know, in plastic material, so very good quality material. Uh, this was uh, available. Now, the new cards have the same uh, but shinier Hashem took back his millions, but the Tikkun Abrit has changed where the QR code is much bigger, cooler looking. Uh, so this is actually the new cards. And they all come in these little compartments, these little plastic uh, uh, things over here. 
where you simply just take one of these things. It has 40 cards in it. You put it on a shelf somewhere on a, uh, uh, you know, a Judaica store, kosher uh, shops, uh, bookstores, synagogues, Jewish community centers, wherever you obviously will find Jews. You put one of these in there, let people take one for free, and literally each one of these cards can save an eternity of not just one person, but their entire family and their entire uh, uh, lineage. So all of that goes to the credit of whoever uh, put it there. So just imagine the benefits. Literally, if I was not doing what I'm doing, I would literally just spend half of my days or just a few hours a day just going around places putting these things there. It's just simply that easy. Uh, in my opinion, this is better than anything else uh, because it's easy to do and it's... Uh, uh, something that has a lot of potential. So that's uh, the thing. Of course, you could always get uh, the uh, USBs as well. They're also on the uh, uh, Kiruv store along with these. So uh, uh, we'll see continuous uh, more orders from you guys uh, that are going to deliver uh, in your communities. So with that being said, we're going to get into it. We have a uh, lot to say, a lot to learn. And Baruch Hashem, Parashat Shlach is full of fireworks and of course the lessons in parashat shlach can sometimes seem obvious because it's the stories There's, you know you have the story of the meraglim the spies they uh you know which we've discussed briefly yesterday uh where you have 12 leaders two of which are tzaddikim 10 used to be tzaddikim and turn into heretics, reshaim, that have no share of the world to come, says the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin in Perik Chelek. Uh, so these, uh, these guys started off good. They, were, they weren't chosen to be leaders uh, for their wickedness. They were chosen to be leaders because they were good at some point, uh, but uh, they lost their way. They lost their way. And later on in the parasha, we also find uh, another person that lost their way. Chachamim say his name was Tzlovchad. And Tzlovchad is officially the first Mechalel Shabbat uh, that Am Yisrael had shortly after we received the Torah. Uh, some say even the second week after we received the Torah, Tzlovchad violated Shabbat and got the death penalty. You know, so Tzlovchad obviously was righteous enough to be one of the few people that Hashem took out of Egypt. He survived all the plagues. He survived the darkness plague of which 80% of Am Yisrael was killed uh, in Egypt. So he's part of the good 20%. He survived that. He survived Yam Suf. He survived seeing the Torah, seeing uh, Hashem speak to Am Yisrael, seeing the voice of God, the sounds of God. He survived all of this good, extraordinary stuff and he actually was a prophet. Everyone was a prophet uh, at the time of Yam Suf. We, they all saw things that were superior to what the prophet Yechezkel saw. And anyone that read the book of Yechezkel, you see some of the things that he describes that he saw are literally unimaginable. You simply can't even imagine what he saw. Yet, even the average person, the average person that crossed Yam Suf with Am Yisrael, saw even more than Yechezkel. Tzlovchad was one of them. But yet, after surviving all of this, after doing all of this, he lost his way and he got a death penalty. So, you know, the, the basic lesson is obvious. Don't mess with God, okay? <laughs> you know, do what he says and, uh, and simply, uh, you know, and, and, and simply don't mess around. Now, yeah, but we obviously have to dig a little further. We have to dig a little further to see how all of this applies to us. Dig inside our hearts and try to find uh, where we really stand. Because uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed last night in the lecture is that uh, there are times where uh, that in their mouth and their lips they honored me, says Hashem. Uh, but in their hearts, they're far away from me. Many times you uh, uh, can find uh, a person uh, where they have, they, you know, they pay lip service to Hashem. You know, they pray, they say compliments, they say Baruch Hashem. But really when push comes to shove, 
when it comes to the test of Amuna, of, of actually trusting Hashem, of having bitachon, that whatever decree He gave us is the best thing for us, even if it doesn't look good, even if it's a lost lawsuit, even if it's a lost deal, even if it's a lost relationship, somehow this is the best, because that's what bitachon is. Bitachon is not that I believe that everything is going to work out. That's not bitachon. That's simply, uh, you know, faith that people uh, of, of other nations have where they just simply think if they think good good things will happen that's not judaism judaism is have confidence in hashem that whatever he gives you that is the best which means that sometimes the best will hurt sometimes the best will sting sometimes the best will look like the worst having confidence in hashem means you know with complete faith with complete confidence that what you have in front of you is the best possible circumstance that's available to you that's confidence in them that's bitachon so we have to dig deep down and, and and see where we stand because sometimes a person can say they have bitachon and hashem but the second things don't work out all of a sudden it's like where is hashem why is hashem doing this to me wait hold on a second weren't you the one that said you had bitachon and hashem Weren't you the one that said you had Emunah Hashem? Yeah, I believe that he's going to help me out. Well, he did. What do you mean? The car broke down. The deal didn't work through. I didn't get the job. Exactly. He helps you out. How is that helping me out? Oh, how it's helping you out is a different story. That's a different question altogether. Did he help you out? 100%. You don't see how he helped you out. You don't see how he saved you. But certainly, if you had beat the Khan, you would. So, we have to dig. We have to see where we really stand because we can't be fakers. We can't lie to ourselves and say, you know what, we believe in Hashem, but in reality, the second a test comes, all of a sudden we have crocodile tears and uh, we start asking, where is God? So we have to figure out where this is in the parasha, where we are in the parasha, and Bezrat Hashem, once we see the results, we can act accordingly. So, Parashat Shlach, as we said, the story starts with the Meraglim, the spies, simply put, were a mistake from the beginning. Moshe Rabbeinu hears the people complain, which unfortunately has become a pattern. They complain and complain and complain. Now they're complaining about the fact that, how do we know that this land that God is sending us to is good? Well, simple. He said it's good. But unfortunately, Am Yisrael did not have Emunah and Hashem. They didn't have the Bitachon. That's why they got punished multiple times. And multiple times Hashem says, why don't they have Emunah in me? How long will I have, you know, uh, need to have patience with these people that have no Emunah in me? So, they have no Emunah. They don't believe that the land is good enough. They want to send spies. They want to send spies. They want to send people to go see what's going on over there. What kind of food is there? What kind of people are there? What kind of uh, uh, problems are there? And Moshe Rabbeinu obliges and says to Hashem, they want to send spies. Hashem says, you want to send spies, send spies. But that's not because I agree with you. I'm simply, you're, you're allowed to use your free choice. At that moment, Moshe Rabbeinu knew two things. Number one, there's no turning back because you already told the people, you know, you could do what you want. You can't, can't uh, 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 go back on your word. It's uh, going to look bad. On the other hand, he also knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not a fan of this whole thing. And therefore, he gave a special blessing to Yeshua Benun. Yeshua Benun, if you notice, in the beginning of the parasha, and uh, in the beginning of when he's mentioned first, he is not called Yeshua Benun, he's called Hoshea. He's called Hoshea, but then it says that the uh, Hashem, uh, that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu gave him a blessing and added a yud to his name. He called him Yehoshua, Yehoshua Ben Nun. Now, the Gemara says there's a big story about this yud. Most people think that you could just simply add letters to the Torah or subtract them, and it's uh, just not a big deal. Let me tell you. It's a big deal. Many years before this parasha, at the time of Avram Avinu, Avram wasn't called Avram, he was called Avram. 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed him and added a hey, the letter hey to his name. His wife, the tzaddikah Sarah, wasn't called Sarah. She was called Sarai. HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed her and put a hey in her name and removed the yud. But since these letters are the tools that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world with, created the Torah with, this Yud had a life. And the angel of this Yud cried in the heavens for centuries. For centuries, the Yud, the little Yud, the smallest, physically smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the Gemara says, was crying in the heavens for centuries. Why? Why did you take me out of your holy Torah, Kadosh Baruch What did I do? What did I do? Bring me back in the Torah. I used to be a part of the Torah. I was part of Sarah's name. She was Sarai's. You took me out of Kadosh Baruch Hu. How, how, Why? What did I do? Comes Moshe Rabbeinu and blesses Yoshua Benun. And the Gemara says he adds the Yud. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Finally I'm able to make it up to that little Yud that's been crying to me for centuries of why I removed it from the Torah. It was simply to put it somewhere else where it would be more useful. So here we see that every single letter is accounted for. Hashem had the Torah in one way and it always stayed that way. But when time came to change something as far as change the name, he didn't change the letters. He simply just put the, that one letter somewhere else because no one could add or subtract the letter from the Torah. In fact, the, uh, when, when Chachamim uh, said, but uh, perhaps maybe uh, Shlomo HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech, maybe he can change something, maybe he can do something, he has such wisdom. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, let a thousand Shlomos, a thousand Shlomos live in this world and die in this world and not a single letter in my Torah would change. Meaning as great as Shlomo HaMelech, was he cannot be compared to the perfection of the holy Torah. After this, we see the Miraglim go to Eretz Israel at that point called Knan. Kalev ben Yefune knows that these Miraglim already on the way, they started talking about their plans of what they're going to do, their evil plans. He realizes these people are no good. There's no turning back. He wants protection from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and since he did not get a blessing from Moshe Rabbeinu, he goes to the Marat HaMachpelah to pray at the grave site of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. There he gets the blessing. Yeshua Benun has a blessing. The Meraglim are simply looking for trouble. They're looking for things in such a way where they're looking for a way to misreport, meaning they're looking for bad stuff and they find it. When they see there are giants, Anakim, in the land, huge people, enormous, so enormous that at one point the Meraglim saw the fruits and they all fit under one leaf, one leaf of the pomegranate, one leaf. Of the, I'm sorry, of the, uh, of the tree. All of them fit under one leaf to hide from these Anakim, to hide from these giants. The giants were enormous. People ask, well, if the giants are real, how come we didn't find giant bones? Well, two questions for you. Number one, who says we didn't find? What, your uh, government says we didn't find? Do they really tell you the truth all the time? Your uh, archaeologist told you? Who, who told you we didn't find? That's number one. I'm not saying we found. I'm just saying, how do you assume we didn't find? Number two, a bigger, a bigger question is, why do you think we should have found it? Just because it existed. Because anyone that does a quick, quick, literally 30 second research on the internet and looks up how much of the actual globe, how much of the actual planet have we explored, have we actually 
gone to, lived, dug, done experiments, everything, you'll see that it's a very, very small amount. A very small amount of the land and very small amount of the ocean. And needless to say, the desert is the least of it all. So it's not like you have a, uh, an enormous amount of uh, research being done in the middle of the desert uh, looking for, for, for bones. So it's not, a, um, it's not really a complication of why we didn't find it. The reality is we didn't look and we still haven't looked because there are many things that are even in your own backyard. If you live in different parts of the United States or different parts of the world, many times many things in your own backyard were never searched. You know, you have a uh, big backyard. Did anybody ever dig down in there? No. You have a big field. You have a farmland. Did everybody dig under the ground. You know what's under the ground? No. So it's a silly question. It's a non-starter question, but it really shows that a person hasn't really thought the question through. Point being is the giants existed. Why? The Torah says they did. If it's not in the Torah, it doesn't exist. If it's in the Torah, it's 100% true. So now... The giants existed, but what's, what the Miraglim took as the worst part was that they saw that the giants were burying someone. And when they came back and reported to the people, instead of just reporting to Moshe and, and Aaron, they reported to everyone at the same time, which means that their complaining infected other people. Hence the reason why they got punished so severely, because they ended up becoming machtier rabim. They caused other people to sin, other people to become heretics. And they said that this Eretz Ochelet Yoshvea, this is a land that eats its own people. Because if look how big these giants are, but even these giants, the land is killing them. Truth be told, though, the Chachamim teach us in the Gemara, that the, the, the burial was actually the burial of the prophet Job. Job was the, uh, the Gdolador, Job was the tzaddik that gave the, uh, 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 the, the land, uh, in essence, its merit at that time. And uh, Job was the one that died. That's who they were all burying. In fact, when Moshe Rabbeinu told uh, the, the Meraglim, the spies, Go and uh, find a, uh, see if there's a tree. Usually if you're going to go to a place, you're not going to look for a tree. You're going to look for trees, plural. But he says tree. Why tree? Because a tzaddik is often, uh, 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 the, the word to describe a tzaddik is a tree. Because he doesn't move. He's firm. He's grounded. So Moshe Rabbeinu was telling the, uh, the Meraglim, see if there's a tree. See if there's a tzaddik. Meaning... Rashi says he's referring to Job. See if Job is still alive. And if he is, get strengthened by him. Meaning get chizuk from him. Get some uh, words of Torah from him. Learn from him. Moshe Rabbeinu heard about uh, the prophet Job. The whole world heard about the prophet Job. So now, Job dies. The giants bury him. At one point, the giants see the Miraglim roar at them, the few that they saw, and from fear, those Miraglim die. Like they literally die. And then the other Miraglim do a, 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 some things to, to revive them. The Midrash over there says they used uh, some of the uh, uh, things that are used in modern technology in order to revive people, to resuscitate people and bring them back to life. And this we actually discussed in our film several years ago uh, in a, uh, the Torah science and uh, ancient wisdom uh, about this particular uh, Midrash. But uh, after they came back, they told everybody, listen, these giants are stronger than us. Chachamim say, stronger than us is spelled the same exact way as stronger than him. The only difference is the dots, the nikud. Chazakim, ki chazaku mimenu, ki chazaku mimeno. Nu or no? That's the difference. So 
So initially it looks like, no, they're stronger than us. But in reality they meant they're stronger than him. They're stronger than God, these giants. That was their heresy. That was what sealed their decree. But one of the examples they gave, which we can learn from, is that they said that we were like grasshoppers in, their own, in our own eyes. And so we were in their eyes, meaning that we were as small as grasshoppers are to us, but in their eyes. That's how big they were. Now, Rashi over there gives in the Gemara, he uh, gives some details about the grasshopper. Unique details about the grasshopper. Now, I don't know if uh, you've seen a grasshopper lately, but even if you have, you're not, you know, not, not everyone is necessarily quick to pick up these types of things. I certainly am not. But uh, last time I saw a grasshopper, I usually, you know, I see him from a couple of feet away, uh, but that's pretty much as close as we get. We're not really good friends. I'm not good friends with any, uh, any of these uh, little creatures. But some people are. Some people pick them up, play with them, all types of things. And there are certain uh, 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 species of a grasshopper, the locusts that are kosher, that the Yemenites uh, eat and the Moroccans eat uh, to this day. The Gemara says that there were a certain type of locusts that were kosher that uh, actually expanded the mind of the person to absorb literally endless amount of Torah. If he ate it the right way, and he would have to eat the other way, meaning he would have to eat one side of it to open up his mind, and then to, once he's done, he has to eat the other side in order to close up his mind, or else it, it's not going to turn out so good. So these grasshoppers have a, have a history. Rashi says these grasshoppers, there's a species of them that have five eyes. Five eyes, and they are blinded in the morning because they don't have eyelids, and they're blinded each morning because of the dew. Now, this is spectacular knowledge for anyone who doesn't realize it yet. Rashi lived 900 years ago, before the telescope, the microscope, and any of this knowledge was available to the average person because if you picked up a grasshopper, there is no way that your naked eye can tell that this grasshopper has five eyes because most people think it has two eyes, the two big ones. But the truth is it has five eyes. In fact, even if you go on Google and you say grasshopper, how many eyes does he have? You may actually see that it says three eyes. But if you type in grasshopper with five eyes, you'll actually see results as well. It all depends on how they, what they define and how they define the eyes and the species of the grasshopper. The point being is that this was knowledge that Rashi had as part of our Masoet from Mount Sinai, not knowledge that Rashi had from being a scientist and looking through some type of uh, you know, a, uh, equipment. Here we see that our sages had knowledge beyond their times. After this... Grasshopper example, the uh, Miraglim entice everyone even further by saying, apparently God wants to send us to this land so we can get killed and they could take our uh, wives and children as hostages. So let's just go back to Egypt, and since Moshe Rabbeinu is not going to agree with it, let's just kill him and pick ourselves a new leader. Rashi over there says, what does it mean, pick ourselves a new leader? Let's pick ourselves a new idol. Meaning, let's abandon this whole thing, this whole plan, including let's abandon God. Let's go back to idolatry like we were doing in Egypt. Furthermore, sealing their fate and confirming how evil they've become. Yeshua ben Nun and Caleb ben Yefune ripped their clothes as a sign of mourning. What are they mourning? 
Onkelos over here says they're mourning that Am Yisrael has lost their faith in Hashem. Am Yisrael has lost their confidence in Hashem. And in essence, what Yeshua ben Nun and Caleb ben Yefune are teaching us is that death is preferable to not having emuna. Because if you don't have emuna, if you don't have bitachon, if you don't have confidence in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, death is even better. Why? Because your life will be endless amount of suffering without any hope for a better day. Because if you have no confidence that whatever Hashem is giving you is good, that means that you're going to go through life like everybody else. And anyone that's old enough knows that most of life is difficult. One difficulty after another. When you're young, you go through the difficulty of trying to figure out who you are. What do you want to do? Waking up early, learning in school, obeying your parents, doing chores, going to sleep when your parents tell you to do, all these types of things that don't necessarily sound like your plan. But you have to do it. And you have to adjust your life. And then after that, you have to go into the world. Get yourself a job. Get married. And it's difficult. Difficult to find a job. Difficult to find somebody that you want to build a future with. But once you find it, you figure, okay, so I got it. I got it. I made it. I got a job. I got a, you know, a wife. I got a husband. Everything's good. But then you wake up and you realize, no, it just started. Now you have to actually go to the job and deal with the customers, deal with the auditors, deal with the government, deal with the uh, lawsuits, deal with headaches, deal with injuries, deal with sick days, deal with an annoying boss or employees or people stealing from you. And then you come home. And you figure, okay, you know what? I'm going to rest finally. Finally, after such a long day, all these annoying people, all these crazy people drive me crazy. I'm so tired. I injured my finger. I'm tired. My foot hurts. My back hurts. Finally, I'm going to get home, relax. And my wife is going to welcome me with open arms. And your wife, as soon as you open up the door, she's crying hysterical. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. What happened, boo-hoo? Well, I just, instead of hello, you're saying boo-hoo. What happened? It didn't happen this month. What do you mean it didn't happen this month? I thought I was pregnant. I'm not pregnant. Maybe God hates me. And he doesn't want me to be pregnant. No, maybe it's just not the time. No, you don't understand me. You're not paying attention to me. Or whatever it is. Somebody said something to her and she got offended. Or uh, she thinks she got fat. Or she thinks she got skinny. Or uh, whatever is happening in her life, as soon as you get home, sometimes that's what you get. And you think, why? Well, can't even get any rest. You know what? Maybe the blessing is going to come once I have some kids. Once I have some kids. And eventually, Akadosh Baruch Hu blesses you with kids. And you say, yeah, the kid's on the way. I can't wait to grow up with that boy. It's going to be fun. We're going to play together. We're going to hang out together. We're going to talk together. He's going to learn with me. He's going to this with me. He's going to do with me. And guess what? One day that baby comes. And uh, he's not learning. He's not teaching. All he's doing is crying, eating, and filling up the diaper. That's all he's doing. And then you realize, I may have to get a second job. Because these diapers are expensive. This food is expensive. This baby is expensive. And he won't stop crying. And I can't sleep for three months already. Life is hard. But you know what? Maybe it's going to get better once I get a raise at the job. And you get, to, you know, to the boss, you tell him, listen, I need a raise. And, I, and the boss says, me too. Well, does that mean you're going to give me one? He goes, when I get one, you'll get one. You get rejected for the raise. Life is hard. And you figure, you know what? The babies, they come with a blessing. Let's pray for Hashem to send us another baby. And baby number two comes. And like, yeah, babies, and I'm going to learn with them. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to out with them i'm gonna play with them you already forgot all the diapers you've been collecting for the last couple of years 
And baby number two comes. And guess what? He's not learning. He's not teaching. He's not nothing. He's doing the same thing the first guy did. He's crying. He's eating. And he's filling up the diapers. By now, the diapers of the first one start having new odor. Life is hard. You finally started sleeping from the first one. Now you stop sleeping. Why? He doesn't want to sleep. She doesn't want to sleep. Life is hard. And you keep going. And you figure, you know what? The baby's supposed to come. I'm going to ask for a raise again. Mr. Boss Man, can I have a raise? I wanted this and I get this and I do this and I do that. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll give you a 10% raise. Oh, I was kind of hoping for like a 100% raise. Like, can you put another zero on there? Because, you know, because real estate is up and, and taxes is up and, 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 and the kids don't stop eating. And, and, and the wife also, and, and, and you know, she's always crying, and 10% and, and is good? Or you want me to just stay at the same thing? Oh, no, 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 it's good, it's good, I was just kidding, I was just kidding. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for that 10%. Thanks, boss. Life is hard. And you keep going. And another kid, and another job, and another raise, and another rejection, and another problem, and all types of things, and life is hard. And you start getting older and you start experiencing other things you never did before. People that you know start dying. People you care about. Sometimes if you're a successful person, the more successful you are, the more prone you are to lawsuits. Lawsuits happen. Time goes on, injuries happen. Time goes on, people get sick. Time goes on, all types of things happen in life and you see that the vast majority of life is simply one obstacle after another. Which means that if you do not have confidence in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, that what you have is the best possible case you could ever have, life is miserable. But if you know that what he's giving you is the best, you could say life is hard, but it's good. You see, the Meraglim simply thought that everything is supposed to be given to them on a silver platter the way they wanted, not the way Hashem wanted. And therefore, when their plan wasn't in sync with the godly plan, they revolted. They showed everyone, perhaps we should go back. They showed everyone they have no emunah. Caleb ben Yefuneh and Yeshua ben Nun tore their garments in mourning for the people's loss of Emunah and Hashem. And they told people, the land is good, don't listen to them. But instead of accepting this Musar from the two tzaddikim, the spies the nation rejected them. In fact, they wanted to pelt them with stones. They rejected the Musar. They rejected the rebuke. They rejected the reminder that you're supposed to believe in Hashem. He hasn't let us down. You just have to have patience. You just have to have emunah. You just have to have bitachon. He didn't bring us all the way here just to destroy us. It doesn't make sense. They didn't want to believe. Why? They were already too busy crying, too busy complaining. You know, sometimes a person gets really sad and perhaps they start crying. The worst thing in the world that they can do at that moment when they start crying is look in the mirror. Worst thing you can do when you cry is look in the mirror. Why? Because once you see your sad face, you become sadder. And you start crying even more. This sometimes happens with kids. They cry about whatever they're crying. Somebody took their toy. Somebody's not doing what they want. And they cry. And they go in front of the mirror. And they see themselves cry. And they start crying even more. But they don't even know why anymore. But they just cry and cry and cry. Now when it's a kid, you know, it's a kid. When it's an adult, it's not so cute. Am Yisrael was supposed to have confidence in Hashem and not cry. But they got too busy looking in the mirror. The mirror being each other. Each person saw the other one crying. 
And the other one saw the other one crying. And the other one saw the other one crying. They all started crying. No one even knows why they're crying, but they're all crying. But this all started because of the Miraglim. They infected the entire people to cry for no reason. Hashem punished them and said, until when will they not have emunah in my word? In spite of all the signs that I've performed in their midst, I will no longer tolerate their sins as I have until now, says Hashem. Here we see Rabotai, Akadosh Baruch Hu, got to a point where he was threatening to destroy everyone. Why? No Emunah in Hashem. No Emunah in Hashem. Everyone knows the punishment. 40 years in the desert until the entire generation dies. All the men between the age of 20 and 60 had to die in the desert. Their children will go and enter the land, but still the children themselves were also punished that they had to pretty much relive this story every year waiting for their parents to die in the desert for 40 years. The Meraglim died a strange death. Rashi says that their tongues came out of their mouth, connected to their stomach, Worms started coming out, out of them. All types of horrible, disgusting things happened. And it was a big celebration once they officially died because it was such an unusual, horrific, traumatizing sight for Am Yisrael to see. Now, We see here, lack of emuna is a big deal. Lack of emuna leads to complaining. Lack of emuna leads to problems. We move on further into the parasha. Kadosh Baruch reminds us multiple times about how the law of the Jew from birth and the convert are the same. Don't get confused. And then he starts going into the details of korbanot, mistakes. He says that if a person makes, if the uh, people make a mistake due to a bad leadership, the leadership is making a mistake, they have to bring a sacrifice, meaning that even though the leadership could be literally one rabbi of a community that tells them nothing when they're driving on Shabbat, everyone has to suffer from that bad decision. But if a person sins in, intentionally, meaning he knows he's Jewish, he knows he's not allowed to drive on Shabbat, and he does it anyway. She knows she's Jewish. She knows that she's not allowed to marry a woman. She does it anyway. Like these two fake Orthodox women did in the last few days where a few people send me these pictures and videos, which I wouldn't recommend anyone seeing because it literally impurifies your neshama to see such an upside-down world. Two women pretending to be orthodox women, marrying each other, surrounded by religious Jews, people with kippah, women with wigs. And they're all celebrating as if this is allowed. The Torah says, but a person who acts openly and defiantly, whether he is of the natives or of the proselytes, meaning the converts. He is provoking the anger before Hashem. That person shall be eliminated from among his people. For he scorned the word of Hashem and distorted his commandments. That person will surely be eliminated. His sin is upon him. 
A person that knows the truth and simply decides to ignore it. That in itself is a sin in addition to the sin itself. Meaning, ignoring the truth is considered desecrating the Torah. When a person simply decides that even though it says in the Torah, men must marry women, women must marry men, Jews must marry Jews, Gentiles must marry Gentiles. And people ignore it. When the Torah says that you must do business honestly, no stealing, no taking advantage of people, and people ignore it. When the Torah says don't worship idols, whether that idol is money or some statue of some idiot that died 2,000 years ago, named Yoshke, and people do it anyway, a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you violated the Torah, there will be a consequence. Now, after this, ignoring of the truth, we see it again. Where it says the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they found a man and he was in ga- gathering wood on Shabbat. They caught him, they arrested him, they brought him to Moshe and they waited after putting him in a prison, waited for Hashem to give them instructions because they knew it's a death penalty, they just didn't know which one. Now, if you look at the verses, it says that they found a man, and he, as he was gathering wood on the Shabbat day. Rashi says over there, I'm sorry, Uncle says over there, that uh, this is actually telling us that they warned him. When they found him, it's to tell you that they warned him. Because the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says that there is no death penalty without a warning first. Meaning, they told him, you are violating Shabbat. If you do it again, you will get death penalty. He, just like the spies, ignored the truth. Ignored the Musar. Said, ah, no, come on. You guys are uh, old-fashioned. They gave him a warning. Don't drive on Shabbat. Don't put idolatry on your head. Don't pray to a person. Don't do business dishonestly. He said, you guys are fanatic. I don't believe that God's going to punish me. God loves everyone. You're right. He loves everyone. But if you go against him, you become one of his haters. And therefore he has to punish you. And that too is out of love. Now, a person ignores the truth, suffers the consequences. Tzlovchad ignored the truth, ignored the warning that's promised by the Torah any time there is a death penalty. Each time, if you look at the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, each time they say, okay, if a person does such and such, this is the verse that says it's death penalty. The very next question, the Gemara says, okay, but where's the warning? Meaning every single prohibition that says there's going to be a punishment for it has to have a warning. There has to be two statements for each one. So here, we know that Slofchad was warned, but he decided to ignore it. Many people are warned. 
To hear in a shiur Torah, you're not allowed to do certain things. They ignore it. They read something in a book. says, don't do such things. They ignore it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends them problems. Sicknesses, financial losses, marriage problems. All types of disasters. They ignore it. Ignoring the truth leads to bigger problems. In Slovchad's case, it led to death penalty. It led to the death penalty. And after this, we get the mitzvah tzitzit. What's the connection? What's the connection between all of these miraglim and the tzitzit, the ignoring of the truth? In our tefillah every day, we say at the end of Amidah, Yil ratzon imre pi ve'egyon lebi lefanecha, Hashem tzuri ve'goali. Let me find, let find favor the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart before you, Hashem, my might and my redeemer. Meaning that, let the words that I'm saying to you and the thoughts that are in my mind, what I really feel, because the, the words are not necessarily always the same thing as the thoughts. Some people prefer for Hashem not to know their thoughts, Shem Yishmo, because they have perverted, disgusting thoughts. But in our prayer, every day we say to Hashem, right now as I'm praying to you, both my thoughts and my words that are coming out of my mouth are both good. Let them both come in front of you. Both be served to you as if it's a sacrifice. Both show you that I have complete faith in you. Both show you that I have nothing but you. The Sefer Daily Dose of Bitachon by Rav Satin, he was one of the Talmidim of uh, Rav um, Tzion Abba Shaul. And he writes, sometimes we'll see certain people have clothing that are like the clothing for exercising. You know, they have these sweatpants and sweatshirts and sneakers. But, even though they're wearing it, it's very obvious they haven't exercised in a while, if ever. They have the exercise clothes, but they don't exercise. He says, sometimes, people's Bitachon in Hashem. Confidence in Hashem. They say they have it. But in reality, they don't exercise this bitachon. They don't test out to see if they have this bitachon or not. They wait for a test. They wait for something. Assuming that their clothing is going to be enough. Their words are going to be enough. Rabbi Yisrael Misalant in Sefer Or Yisrael says why should Hashem alter his method of conducting the world without a great and overriding motivation? Only when provided with an exceptional cause to do so will he elevate a person beyond the stricture of nature. And this is in accordance with the divine attribute of midah keneged midah. So when we are praying, we're praying for Hashem to change whatever decree is on us. We're saying to Hashem, here are my words, here's what's in my heart and my mind, let it be, come before you. In essence, you're asking Hashem to change what's happening to you. Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, why? Why do you think he's going to change? Just because you asked? If you asked 
in the same fashion as the guy wears exercise clothes, meaning it's not real, then uh, don't expect any change to actually happen. Because ultimately, the Shulchan Aruch says that we're supposed to have kavana, intention, when we pray, when we do mitzvot, when we bless. We can't be robots like we spoke about last night. But the kavana is not for Hashem. As I thought about B'siyat Yishmaya some time ago, I realized that kavana is a person doing himself a favor. Because the whole purpose of kavana, the whole purpose of having intention behind your blessings, your prayers, everything, is for you to connect to Hashem. That's the whole point. You have intention to pray, to connect and get closer to Hashem, to have more confidence in Hashem, to believe in Hashem. So if you're praying like a robot, if you're blessing like a robot, if you're practicing the religion like a robot, then not only do you not have kavana, but you're not even fulfilling the purpose for yourself. Because if what you thought you were doing was praying to Hashem to get close to Him, and you know that to get close to Him, you have to have intention behind your prayer, but yet you don't push yourself and do something to get that attention there, then in essence, all you've done is simply go to some government building and ask him to give you all the money while you're outside. And there's no one in front of you. You're just talking to the building. That's what you did. You went to some building, said, give me all your money. And the building didn't respond. Why? Because you're talking to a building. Lehavdil you're talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, at least. You're thinking you're talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but your mind is about the stock market. Your mind is about your lawn and how you have to fix it. Your mind is about your backyard, your front yard, your car, the flat tire, your wife, your this, your that. You're thinking about everything else except Hashem. Rabbi Yisrael Yisrael says that in order for Hashem to alter his methods of conducting this midah keneged midah, this this measure for measure, it's only going to happen if there's an exceptional cause. Because as he continues and he says earlier, if a person wishes to change his fortune for the better, it will not avail him to merely improve his physical situation, i.e., let's say, if he has more money, therefore his situation is going to be better. If he has more kids, therefore his situation is going to get better. If he gets married, therefore his situation is going to get better. Rabbi Salam says, the physical situation will not make your situation better. More kids, more wife, more this, more this, not, it's not, or less, it's not going to make your situation better. Why? Because the situation is bad, not because of the physical issues, but rather because of the creator above that gives you a certain perspective of how to look at things. And you're not following it. And therefore, if a person wishes to change his fortune for the better, it will not avail him to merely improve his physical situation, neither is it proper for him to petition the Almighty in prayer and supplication Because, again, if he's of the mindset that he's just going to go through the motions and that's going to change things, it's not. His only hope is to rectify the ultimate cause, which is to improve his spiritual side and the ways of his soul. As the sages teach us in Gemara Maseret Brachot, if a person sees that afflictions have come upon him, let him, let him examine his deeds as it says, let us search and examine our ways and return to Hashem, says the prophet Eicha. The prophet Jeremiah wrote Eicha. What he does, when he does that, then let us lift up our hearts with our hands to Hashem in heaven. In so many words, waking up, praying, doing mitzvot is not enough. If your heart is not with a Kadosh Baruch Hu, nothing's going to change. Difficulties will continue happening and you are going to continue suffering them if you don't change that heart. 
Because you're thinking that your boss is your savior. Your customer is your savior. The next contract that you're going to get is your savior. The house you're going to buy is your savior. The building you're going to get is your savior. You're thinking that once you get this material, this, this, this wife, this husband, this ring, this watch, this thing, that's your savior and that's your mistake. You're thinking that if you didn't have this problem, this lawsuit, this illness, this pain, this agony, then the problem is going to be solved. You're wrong. It's not it. Why? Because you're not understanding that the key ingredient to all of your problems, lack of bitachon and Hashem. You don't realize that all of this is happening because Hashem was trying to talk to you. And in fact, as Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, he brings the prophet Eicha also again in chapter 3, verse 37 to 41, where a person must understand this verse whose decree was ever fulfilled unless the lord ordained it is it not from the mouth of the most high that evil and good emanate of what should a living man complain a man for punishment of his sins let us search and examine our ways and return to hashem let us lift up our hearts with our hands to hashem in heaven here, the prophet, the, the prophet is telling us, says Rabbi Saimi Salant, he's telling us that if we want Hashem to change, we have to change. But not change our physical situation, rather f- change our spiritual situation. Starting with our actions of how we treat servitude of Hashem, but also how we treat the importance of having confidence in Hashem. Regardless of what the situation looks like. Now, he says further that if a person tries to serve Hashem, with simply blind faith. It won't work. Blind faith sounds like a good thing, sounds like a really big believer, but it's not. Why? He says, if you just simply follow, they tell you go to synagogue, go to synagogue. Tell you read Tehilim, you read Tehilim. They tell you uh, go to uh, uh, a uh, yeshiva, go to yeshiva. They tell you don't drive on Shabbat, you don't drive on Shabbat. You simply do what you're told. You're not going to survive. You're going to suffer a lot. Why? Because you don't have a real connection with Hashem. You're just a robot. The moment tests come, all of those actions that you're doing which are connecting you to Hashem will fall apart. You'll say, oh yeah, I said that Hashem, you know, is going to help me, he's going to help me, he's going to help me, and, 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 and look, he didn't help me, so... Maybe there's no Hashem. That's, that's in essence the mentality. Says Rabbi Israel Misalan, the second way is servitude of Hashem through critical analysis and contemplation of the ways of the divine service and the state of one's character. Pursuing this path, this path implants a secure stake to firmly anchor a person's divine service. So all the winds of the world cannot dislodge it from its place. In so many words, a person that wants to connect to Hashem has to have kavana everywhere. Not just in their prayer, not just in their blessing, but in their entire day. They're constantly looking for God. They're constantly analyzing what God is sending them And comparing it to their behavior and where they're lacking, what they have to fix. Oh, look, I got a flat tire on the way to the appointment. Did I do anything? Oh, maybe I didn't give enough tzedakah. Or maybe I uh, didn't pray. Or maybe I didn't have enough uh, this. Oh, you know what? I did everything good. Okay, so it must be that Hashem is saving me. 
they analyze things in such a fashion where they're looking for where they're lacking in their behavior, but at the same token of how Hashem is helping them at the same time. Critical analysis of their actions as well as the world that Hashem is showing them. He says that will put your bitachon in such a stronghold, it'll be like as if it's anchored to the ground, anchored to the earth. And no one could uproot it. No bad experience or trauma or difficulty could uproot it. If you're simply following blindly, he says, a small wind could uproot it. The Gemara Masechet Yoma, page 76a, which the Rav brings also, says, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring the man to Am Yisrael each day? Why didn't he just give it to them once a year? I mean, it's all miraculous anyway. It's heavenly food falling from the heavens. It's a, uh, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be uh, digested in, uh, in the same fashion as regular food. It all turns to blood. No one has to go to the bathroom. It's all miraculous food anyway. So why don't you just give them one man, once a year, and they're good for the whole year? Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was training Am Yisrael to connect to him. How? If you don't know what you're going to eat tomorrow, you pray to Hashem. You pray to Hashem. Why? You ate today, but you're not sure what's going to be tomorrow. So you pray. Hashem, can you feed me tomorrow too? Can you feed me tomorrow too, please, Hashem? I know I eat food, but, but I know tomorrow I'm going to be hungry too. Can you feed me tomorrow too, please, Hashem? Akadosh Baruch Hu wants his children to pray to him. Akadosh Baruch Hu wants his children to connect to him. If he didn't want us to connect to him, he would have given us the blessing once a year, like the snake, once a lifetime. But Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to give us the obstacles, the difficulties. Why? Because those are the times we connect him the most. Now, if a person reviews his flaws and his own need to do tshuva and follows it, by studying the words of the sages, studying Musar, he's going in the right path. Studying Musar means you don't just listen to the lecture, but you repeat the teachings over and over in your mind. And you constantly review your soul and the world that you live in and the situations and circumstances that are being presented to you in order to see where you're lacking. Then, the Rav says, you're going to move on to the second level, which is conquering your evil inclination. And after that, you'll get to rectifying the evil inclination so that you'll be able to actually enjoy the servitude of Hashem. Meaning that in the beginning, whether your beginning is that you've been from robot, from AI for your whole life, or you've been an idol worshiper your whole life, desecrating Shabbat left and right, and now you're finally doing tshuva, regardless of where your beginning is, in the beginning, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Why it's not pleasant? Simple. You have no idea what you're doing. It's like a person going and playing for the first time. And he starts running. It's like, no, you're going the wrong way. Oh, okay, okay, he starts running the other way. He goes, no, no, you're not supposed to run. Stand. He doesn't know how to play. It's not enjoyable. You look silly. Says Rabbi Yisraeli Misalant, servitude of Hashem, first and foremost, requires a person to understand they have to review their own actions, their flaws, and desire to change, desire to do tshuva. Once they have that, they'll start learning. The words of the sages, specifically Musar, then, of course, Allah had to know what to do. After they've done this for a while, 
They're constantly reviewing themselves. They're constantly improving themselves. Eventually, they'll be able to overcome their evil inclination. A little bit at a time. And eventually even get to a point where they're enjoying the mitzvot. They're enjoying learning Torah for hours. They're enjoying giving tzedakah. They're enjoying doing chesed. They're enjoying doing everything. They're even enjoying looking for Hashem through the difficulties. Oh, look at that. Look what happened. Flat tire. Oh, look at that. We just lost. Oh, look at that. We just got a problem. Oh, look at that. I wonder how Hashem is going to bring the salvation here. I wonder what Hashem is trying to teach me. I wonder what, what protection Hashem has given me through this tragedy. A person literally gets to a point where he's looking for Hashem at all times with complete confidence that everything that's happening is good. Now how do we know that Hashem wants so much good for us? The Midrash Rabbah says, And Midrash Rabbah Midbar Parasha Gimel. Why were the Levites counted from one month age and up when they were doing the census? Because the Levites couldn't serve in the Bet Midrash when they're one month old. They're babies. So why would you even bother counting them? Count like everybody else when they're, you know, from the age of 20 and up. But the Levites were counted from a month old. In so many words, from the time they're born, they're already counted. Did you ever see a Levite that's one month old doing any service in, in the Bet HaMikdash? No. He has to survive. He can't pray for anybody. He can't do anything. So why is he even counted in the census? Says the Midrash, that's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give them the merit as f- for being his servants in the Bet HaMikdash their whole life. In so many words, Hashem rewarded the Levites for serving him in the Bet HaMikdash their whole life. Even though they didn't really serve in the Bet HaMikdash their whole life. They only started at the age of 30. But he rewarded them for the first 30 years. Another example of this, the Midrash says, is with Shmuel. Shmuel was rewarded as if he led Am Yisrael for 50 years. 52 years. Midrash says, did he really lead Am Yisrael for 52 years? No. First 40 years of his life, the Gdol Ador was Eliyah Cohen. He couldn't lead anybody. He couldn't be the Paskin al in front of his rabbi. And then a couple of years, you had uh, Shaul HaMelech. Shaul was the uh, king. Altogether, he led Ami, Shmuel led Am Yisrael for 10 years. But the Torah says that he led Am Yisrael his whole life. Why does it say he led Am Yisrael his whole life? Hashem says, I want to reward him for his whole life. As if he led Am Yisrael and he did good and he did mitzvot and he passed in Alakha. Yeah, but he was a month old. He was two months old. He passed in Alakha. Yeah, yeah, he did amazing. Where? Where's the book? No, no, he wrote the book. Don't worry. He did book. He did great. Amazing. Chidush. He's six years old. What Chidush? He did amazing Chidush. Why? Akadosh Bahu looks for places to reward the righteous. If you're righteous, Hashem is going to find creative ways to give you more reward than you deserve. You find that bitachon in your heart, Hashem will find ways to reward you even for the times before you had bitachon. On the other hand, Rabotai, we always have to know the other hand so we understand what's at stake. We know that if we have bitachon, life is good. If we don't have bitachon, Yeshua ben Nun, Kalev ben Yefune, said death is better. Dying is better than not having bitachon in Hashem. That's how horrible it is. Because you're suffering and you have no idea why. The Meraglim got a death penalty. 
They got a horrible death penalty. Slovchad got a horrible death penalty. Why? What's the connection? Says Rabbi Yisrael Misalant in Or Yisrael, Akadosh Baruch Hu does not put a person to death until his measure is full. What does it mean his measure is full? Imagine a bottle. And the bottle gets full with more and more sins. Once it reaches the top, Hashem kills the person. So Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, Hashem doesn't kill the person until it reaches the top. At that point, he is wicked, he shall die in his equity, says the Torah. And continues thereafter saying, and you, this is by, this is bringing the prophet Yechezkel, and you, if you warn the wicked one concerning his path to turn from it, but he does not turn from his way, in other words, he's not moved by the rebuke, for if it did move him, and he sensed his shortcomings, he would be considered as one who is capable of repenting, but was previously unaware of his wickedness. However, since he did not respond to rebuke, he is classified as being unable to repent, and therefore he shall die in his iniquity, even if his measure is not full. And in this instance, although he is not classified as being wicked, meaning that his measure is not full, he will still die because of his iniquity, since he's not aroused by rebuke. The Almighty's uh, his extrapolative analysis shows that he will not come to repent. And what is his remedy? To awaken within himself a sense of this deficiency. By arousing feelings of anguish and sorrow, he will thereby enter the company of those who repent and he will live. Here Rabbi Yisrael Misalant gives us an atomic bomb that puts everything in perspective. And this is what he says. If you have bitachon, you literally have everything. Why? Because by having bitachon, first and foremost, whatever problems are sent your way, are just simply ways of communications between you and Hashem. It's like you and Hashem are having a conversation. Why? Because you know that everything He's sending you is the best possible option. He knows what's good for you, better than what you know what's good for you. And therefore, life is not bad. In fact, life is good. And as you gain more and more bitachon, you gain deeper and deeper connection with Hashem. You start from the ground up by realizing you have to fix yourself, by learning Musar, by overcoming the obstacles, the Yetzirah, by developing this yearning to connect to Hashem and look for Him everywhere. Not just hope that Hashem turns into some lotto ticket and gives you presents all the time, but rather everything you're getting is a present. That's having bitachon. On the other hand, not having bitachon, which is literally compared to death by Yeshua ben Nun and Caleb ben Yefuneh, Rabbi Yisrael Misalant tells us why. He says, you see, if you don't have bitachon, not only do you not have everything I just said, where the problems to you look much bigger than what they really are, the difficulties look like they're never going to end, the pain looks like it's simply too much to handle, Life is never good. Why? Because it's not full of difficulties. The pleasing parts of life are so minuscule that you don't even have enough time to enjoy before the next problem appears. Even to have a party. If you're the host, that means you're not really going to enjoy the party. You're simply going to be serving a bunch of people and dealing with problems. The only people that enjoy themselves are the guests. So literally, life is terrible without bitachon. Why? Because you're looking at life at face value, not at divine value. Death is better, says Yeshua ben Nun. But even worse yet, when a person does not have bitachon, that means that when they pray, they don't really believe that Hashem is there. So they don't have kavana. When they don't have kavana when they pray, that means that they're not really connecting to Hashem. 
which is the purpose of the prayer. When they're not connecting to Hashem as the purpose of the prayer, that means that they're not changing themselves and therefore there is absolutely no reason for Hashem to change the decree. And when Hashem doesn't change the decree, things continue and deteriorate actually even further and the person who doesn't have bitachon in the first place continues to suffer even more and this suffering leads this person to rebel to stop even doing what they are doing whatever good they were doing they're not doing anymore in fact they start regretting whatever good they did and even those small sins that would have been forgivable had they had any level of real connection to Hashem become the biggest sins in the world. Why? Because all of the rebuke that Hashem sent them from the shiul, from the USBs, from the books, from the different life experiences that they are dealing with, all of the different forms of rebuke were supposed to encourage them to change, to connect to Hashem, to develop bitachon. But because they did not connect to Hashem, they did not accept the bitachon, that one tiny little sin fills up the entire cup as if the whole cup is full and they literally can get a death penalty for it. That's what Bisa is saying. He's saying the cup is not really full, but because he has no ability to accept the rebuke, to accept the Musar, He's just rejecting it. He doesn't want to hear scary stuff. He doesn't think he needs to change. She doesn't think she needs to adjust her wardrobe. She doesn't think that it's her problem. She thinks it's her husband's problem. Guess what? That attitude can get you killed. Even though it doesn't seem like it's such a bad thing. But it's the attitude that puts a person's mindset at such a fashion, such a position where it's like literally they have no ability to repent. They have no ability to do tshuva. And Hashem says, once it's decreed that this person has no ability to do tshuva, the cup fills up, even by the smallest sin. So on one end, you have this horrible analysis and conclusion While on the other, you have, life is good. Kirvat Hashem li tov. As David HaMelech says in Tehilim chapter uh, 73, verse 28, Kirvat Hashem li tov. Getting closer to Hashem is good for me. On one hand, if I don't have emunah in bitachon, I'm like the miraglim. I'm like the Meraglim if, I'm not, if I don't have Emunah and Bitachon. Yeshua ben Nun says it's better to die that you don't have Emunah and Bitachon. On the other hand, I'm like David HaMelech. Kivat Hashem Litov. Yeah, but David HaMelech has a lot of problems. Yeah, but he's close to Hashem. That means all the problems are just simply conversations with Hashem. That Rabotai is a critical lesson that if we would simply take this to heart, we'll change our life We'll change our families. We'll change our communities. We'll change our eternities. And we'll make the whole process more pleasing than even heaven on earth. With that being said, I'm going to get a quick drink and then you guys can start asking questions. All right. Um, if Kornim are not allowed to marry converts, how was Elazar the exception since he married? Itra's daughter. Uh, the uh, the time of, of of Mount Sinai, things were a little bit different. Uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, so things were uh, slightly uh, different. Number one, some Chachamim say that uh, the uh, before Mount Sinai, obviously the rules were very different, and it could be that they actually married even before Matan Torah. Uh, uh, or they got married before they officially became Kohanim. Do we still have the original Torah that Hashem gave us at Hal Sinai? 
Absolutely. We have, this is one of the uh, 13 principles of our faith, is that the Torah that we have right now is exactly the same Torah that we got at Mount Sinai. If you have a chumash in your house, or if you don't have one, you should go to the store and get one as soon as possible. Or you go to your shul, uh, you get a chumash, or the Sefer Torah that's in the Aron Kodesh in the shul, you open it up, and what you're looking at is exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu looked at 3,334 years ago. Oh, you're actually asking the original Torah, meaning the original Torah scroll that, uh, that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote? No, that was uh, put in the Aron Kodesh inside the uh, Mishkan, then later on in the first Bet HaMikdash. But when uh, they saw that the Bet HaMikdash is on its way to uh, being destroyed, it was hidden. It was the Aron Kodesh alongside everything that was in it, which included the uh, uh, two sets of Ten Commandments, one the broken one and one that was not broken, the second uh, pair of Ten Commandments, the staff of Aron Cohen, uh, the staff of Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, the manna that was in a jar that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu told Aaron to, uh, to keep in a uh, jar. Uh, these uh, things were all inside the Aaron Kodesh and they're all hidden somewhere and are only going to be uncovered once the Mashiach comes. Uh, two people are asking, is a Noahide woman liable if she keeps her pictures online and if she took all of her photos out of her personal profile, yet some pictures remain in the profile of friends, family members, because they refuse to delete it, uh, delete those pictures. Uh, so, I mean, again, what a person did is what a person did. Uh, certainly, there's, this is not going to help a person, but I can assure you that the more dedicated a person is to doing tshuva, to fixing themselves and helping other people do tshuva, the more Hashem will help them. Uh, as the uh, Mishnah in Masechet Avot says, uh, Anyone that helps other people do tshuva, sin does not come to, uh, to his hand. And Chachamim explain, what does that mean, sin doesn't come to his hand? It means that Hashem, a person that helps other people do tshuva, Hashem will help that person fix everything that he made a mistake in the past and throughout his life because he doesn't want the situation to be where all of this person, uh, uh, people that he helped him do tshuva are in heaven and he himself has to go to Geno because of some sins that he made in the past. So in so many words, Hashem is going to help him or her fix all of those things through time. Of course, each person has to exert as much effort as possible to, uh, to fix uh, whatever they can fix that's within their control. But whatever is not within their control, they should uh, rely on Hashem to help them so long as they themselves are helping others. Uh, Rabbi, is it wrong to distance oneself from their parents if they mentally abuse them in order not to disrespect them? And then uh, is one violating honoring them in such a case? So in the uh, Sefer, in Yalkut Yosef by uh, uh, Rav Yitzchak Yosef, he has a section about honoring your parents. And in honoring your parents, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, uh, accept abuse. Uh, that, that's not, uh, you know, honoring parents. Honoring parents, obviously, if your parents are normal, uh, they're decent people, but if, let's say, for example, they don't have any money and you do, you have to, uh, uh, you have to uh, help them. Uh, you, you know, it's a, uh, the, the uh, Bedin will uh, pressure you to help them. If they, they have money, uh, and, but they need help, then you help them, but at their cost. If they ask you to do basic things for them that it's not at any cost, you need to do it for them. But if they are abusive, uh, either uh, in such a fashion where they're trying to get you to violate the Torah, or they're trying to destroy your marriage, or they're simply trying to uh, bring you down and, and cause you all types of hardship, then certainly distancing yourself from them is uh, what you need to do. It's not a, uh, uh, it's not a violation. It's, uh, you have to uh, protect yourself. But again... Uh, a person has to make sure that they're not overly sensitive and it's not their ego uh, telling them that their parents are being abusive. 
Uh, sometimes people uh, view their parents as abusive simply because their parents are simply parents. They're being parents. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's a, uh, some people are a little bit, uh, you know, they exaggerate certain things. I remember there was one person that uh, I uh, blocked multiple times uh, because they kept uh, trying to argue with me that uh, they're right for being angry with their adoptive parents for not asking them if they should adopt them as a baby. Meaning, this baby was abandoned by their parents, the real biological parents. For whatever reason, the real biological parents abandoned the baby. These, this couple made the uh, uh, sacrifice of taking this baby and making it their own child and raising this baby and feeding this baby and taking care of this baby. And of course, you know, disciplining this baby whenever needed in whatever uh, way they knew best. Uh, no abuse that I know of, but for all intents and purposes, they were normal parents that were actually even above uh, the norm because they did something to a complete stranger and made it as if there was their kid. This kid grew up to be an adult that felt that uh, the parents should have somehow uh, requested the permission to adopt them, even though they were a baby. And even when they, uh, <laughs> by the time they developed this demented idea, uh, they were already an adult out of the house. So people like that say, oh yeah, so it's okay that I disrespect my parents, I hate them, I this, I that. Uh, no, it's not okay. You're a sick person. You need to be instituted. Uh, perhaps you should try on a straitjacket and just make sure that somebody else ties it for you. Uh, you know, this is obviously a, not a normal person. There are many people like this that, that exaggerate uh, the discipline that par parents need to give to their kids to make sure they don't simply, you know, uh, destroy the house, destroy their lives, and so on. So there are certain times that parents need to discipline their kids. Sometimes disciplining them means you have to send them to sleep early. Sometimes disciplining them means you have to raise your voice. Sometimes disciplining them means you have to give them a smack. You know, of course, uh, it's not for the sake of hurting the kid or, or, or uh, ex you know, uh, taking out your anger on the kid, but simply to make sure that the kid doesn't go uh, too far with their own bad ideas. So a parent has to discipline kids. When a kids grow up, obviously a lot of those things are not possible, so sometimes the parents will communicate to the kid in the same way that they communicated in the past, where they're still raising their voice at their kid, even though the kid is already 30 years old and doesn't like to be yelled at, especially not in front of people. You know, you know they uh, tell the kid to go do something for them, even though the kid's busy. So the kid is a, uh, thinks that he's not a kid anymore, and therefore the parents should treat him like a peer. The kid is wrong. You will never be a peer to your parents. They are your parents. You will always be their child. They will never be your peer. If you treat your parents as peers, you are violating the Torah, not them. But if the parents are, you know, psychologically uh, uh, not normal, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not all there, uh, if they are intentionally trying to hurt you, intentionally trying to abuse you, intentionally trying to steal from you, uh, they're doing all types of things to harm you, then that's not even a question. Of course, you have to run away. You have to protect your life. But a person needs to make sure that it's, if, if they're going to run, they have to confirm that it's the latter and not the, uh, the first thing where it's really simply their ego. So are you running from evil monsters or are you running from dealing with your ego? And that's what each person has to, has to uh, anal analyze for themselves. Uh, next question. Is there any way you could explain the layout of the area in the Bet HaMikdash where they did the sacrifices? I'm a bit confused between the altars. Uh, that's uh, sure of its own, but there are books about this. Uh, there is a book actually by Art Scroll that goes into uh, a lot of the details, even has a, a very, very beautiful... Uh, uh, pictures uh, in it 
of the Beit HaMikdash. I mean, in so many words, there are, you know, a, uh, different sections of the Beit HaMikdash. There, were, there was the big uh, uh, Mizbeach outside. There was a Mizbeach on the inside. You know, there's the uh, women's court. Uh, there is the Kodesh. There's the Kodesh Kodeshim. When, for example, they uh, had to uh, bring a Korban, there was a, uh, it wasn't just one Korban at a time. There were stations. There were stations uh, for where, where they would take the, uh, the animal. There was rings uh, connected to the floor. They would uh, uh, have the animal uh, under that uh, ring, connected to that ring. One uh, person would slaughter this uh, animal. Then they would have to make sure that uh, they have a bowl right under the slaughter so the blood that's you know, splashing out, that must be collected. That blood must be collected and then taken over uh, as part of the sacrifice and poured on the Mizbeach. If they don't do this blood service, the whole Koban is worthless. The whole Koban is worthless. So after they pour the blood, they go back to the animal and they hang it. There was rings uh, that they would hang the animal uh, to make it easy for them to skin the animal and then cut its, a, uh, its stomach, and then start taking out the organs, and then put the certain parts of the animal on the Mizbeach as a uh, sacrifice, and then certain parts, the, uh, you know, they would sometimes they would eat. It depended on what type of korban that it was. If they did not have uh, the open area, meaning where there was a bunch of people already there, all of the rings were already taken up, you know, let's say there is, uh, let's just for argument's sake, let's say there's eight rings where you could hang the animal and all of them are already busy. People are already there, you know, skinning the animals and two people had to do it. Then they would, there was a, a section where they had these uh, thin uh, uh, sticks or boards where two people would put a board on their shoulder, each one on the shoulder, each one facing the other. And while they're having the, the, uh, they had the boards, they would hang the animal on the boards and then they would skin the animal and then do everything else that I just mentioned as far as taking out the body, the, uh, the organs and so on. Now, if this was on Shabbat, the, uh, the Mishnah in, Mas- in Masechet Psachim uh, says that if it was on Shabbat, then they would not be able to take on these, uh, these boards. Uh, so they would actually have to uh, two guys would have to uh, go shoulder to shoulder. Two Kohanim would have to go shoulder to shoulder. One guy, his hands on his shoulder, the other guy, his hands on his shoulder, and then hang the, the, uh, the cow or the bull or whatever animal it is off of their arms and then skin it, which is obviously very, very difficult to say the least. Uh, but that's what they would have to do. Uh, and also, they wouldn't be able to take the, uh, uh, the sacrifice that they're able to eat they wouldn't be able to take it out of the Bet Mikdash because uh, the, uh, you, you can't take it from uh, one Reshu to the other. So they would have to all go to specific areas of the Bet Mikdash that were designated for this, wait until the end of Shabbat, and then uh, bring the rest of the Koban uh, to their house at the end of Shabbat. The point being is, is that the service in the Bet Mikdash was very, very extensive. I'm just giving you a small token of some of the stuff uh, that uh, that I know, but uh, the the point being is that there were different sections. There were sections for the korbanot. There were sections in the Bet Hamikdash for haircuts. There were sections for 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 burning wood. There were sections for the uh, purifying themselves. Uh, it was literally like a city. It was a city. Though you had the sections where uh, they had the, the cows and different animals uh, pe- that people would buy. Uh, there was, you know, there was many, many different departments in the Bet Hamikdash that uh, each one served different purposes. Each one was part of the overall uh, 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 service uh, at the Bet Hamikdash. To uh, uh, and that's something that uh, I don't think it's even possible to do in a single shoe, or at least not for me. But uh, perhaps a series on something like this. But I would say it's probably better uh, to simply watch a uh, video about it. There are videos uh, about this and uh, uh, that show the service in the Bet HaMikdash with actual digital imagery of the Bet HaMikdash. I remember uh, we saw it on the way to, uh, uh, to uh, Eretz Yisrael 
Uh, that was one of the things they had on the plane, different, uh, that Kola Lashon channel, the, uh, and uh, you were able to watch this and other things. It's, I'm sure you could find it online also on YouTube, and, or at least on Kola Lashon's website, where they had a uh, digital imagery uh, of the service at the Bet Mikdash. So it shows you all of the areas that you're asking about. It shows you how they did it. It shows you what I just described, I, I, I think, or at least part of what I just described. Maybe not the sticks and the other stuff, but uh, the first part. Uh, and uh, it shows you a lot of things. And, of course, you can always read in books. Uh, the uh, the Gmarot and, and the other things. Uh, if manners goes to say Birkat Kohanim, since he's a Kohen, should one leave the shul? Uh, I wouldn't pray in the shul in the first place. But if uh, if he's the only one, then yes. But uh, usually there's more than one person uh, doing Birkat Kohanim. Uh, how do we actively work on our fear of heaven? Uh, as Rabbi Salami Salan said, a uh, person needs to learn Musar. Uh, needs to learn Musar, but not just simply reading or listening to it, but rather reflecting. When you're hearing it or when you're reading it, reflect. Where do you stand? Do you do this? Do you not do this? Why don't you do this? Uh, and if you do it, are you doing it as well as you should? Uh, and, 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 you know, a person has to uh, repeat these ideas in their mind all the time to uh, constantly uh, improve themselves. Uh, one of the things that I always recommend that's actually mentioned by one of the uh, uh, people here is when you're watching uh, my shurim at least, I don't, you know, again, different rabbis give different shurim, different styles, but since I bring, Baruch uh, Hashem, uh, uh, you know, many different sources and uh, different ideas, it's not just a, a general conversation, uh, a lecture of this type requires people to write notes. If you're watching my lectures without writing notes, you're simply wasting your time uh, because 99.9% .9 of what I'm saying, you're going to forget right away. And the little bit that you remember, you'll forget in a couple of days. Uh, so the best thing, the best way to, uh, to watch these lectures is by watching them and taking notes of different ideas that you want to remember, that stood out for you. Even my own kids, Baruch Hashem, little tzaddikim that they are, they uh, watch my uh, lectures and they no take notes. And after the uh, shirim, I'm going to go sit down with them and we're going to go over what their notes are. What did you write? Ovadia is going to tell me, Oh, Abba, I wrote uh, 50 things. I wrote uh, 20 things. I wrote whatever he wrote. And he writes different words and different things that stood out for him. And then Sarah is going to tell me, well, you know, she, what did you write? Oh, Abba, I wrote 30 or 50 or 100 things. And she'll tell me all the different ideas that she wrote. And uh, little Yosef, if he's still awake, he'll tell me some things that he remembers. And then I'll ask them, you know, what was your favorite thing about the shiu? And each one will tell me what was their favorite. Usually their favorites are sometimes when I make a fool of myself and make you guys laugh uh, by walking around or doing all types of uh, things like that. Or if I tell a good story. Uh, but uh, the point, today probably this is going to be their favorite uh, part me talking about them but the point is is that if my little kids can write notes and my lectures certainly adults can write notes and uh, and and guess what the the beauty of these notes is that now you're taking what you're learning and you're using multiple senses to learn it where first you hear it if you're watching the video that means you're also watching it but now that's again superficial watching when you're watching what you're writing, it's much more significant. And when you're touching the pen or pencil and you're writing it, you're now using, a, you're now using an additional sense of your senses to learn the same Torah, which is really the equivalent of learning the same thing multiple times. Hence the reason why anyone that writes notes uh, remembers a lot more than people that don't write notes. And the best part about it is that if you continue writing notes when you're watching these lectures, after a while, you're going to start filling up notebooks. You're going to start filling up one notebook after another. Those notebooks are going to be like, literally, that's your study. That's what you have. That's your best Torah. And I can tell you, Baruch Hashem, I have a bunch of different uh, notebooks from, that I've uh, um, worked on over the years. Each one of them... Uh, is 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 full full of uh, of of like literally enough Torah to 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 resurrect the dead, 
Uh, I could. Uh, I remember one time I uh, I was uh, I went to Los Angeles, and I gave a uh, uh, some lectures over there. And uh, one time I was invited to a place where it was a me and another uh, rabbi uh, speaking. And uh, before we was, you know before we started, the rabbi was sitting to me, talking to me a little bit, and then he started. You know, he saw my books. And then he saw, you know, uh, which is usually I bring a lot more books than, you know, average you know, people do because I look at things a little bit differently. Uh, but that's an explanation for another day. But he also saw my notebook. And he took an interest in my notebook. He's like, can I, can I see your notebook? And I said, sure, go ahead. And he started opening my notebook. And he started seeing one page, all these ideas, another one, another one, another one. He says, wait, so... You could pretty much just, you can give a lecture, like if, for like a hundred years, with with this thing. Like I'm like, oh Hashem, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, it's like, that's the thing. Once you have these ideas written down, and not just staying in a textbook or staying in the video, but the act you actually have taken them and you've written them down, especially if you've written them down with a pen or a pencil, not with a uh, machine. Like sometimes people like to write things with the uh, machines, typing it and so on. It's still okay. I used to do that to a certain extent when I first started, but I saw a lot more value when I actually use old-fashioned pen and paper uh, to write. Um, it's, uh, it does, it's, just, it's better for the memory to do it that way. When you do that, you've literally taken that part of the Torah and you've made it your own. You've made it your own. That's going to help with your memory that's going to help with your Yirat Shemaim. That's going to help with your ideas. That's going to help with your Shabbat table if you want to say something. That's going to help if you want to give a shiur. That's going to help if you simply just want to remember what you've learned and not be one of these people that goes to Shulet Torah for 20 years, but you can't even give a Dvar Torah for five minutes because you don't remember anything. So writing down notes is very critical, and I think people that watch Shulet Torah and don't write notes are simply wasting their time. Because they're not going to remember pretty much anything that they read, anything that they uh, that they have uh, uh, watched in Shulim. Uh, over time, they'll forget everything, unless the same thing was repeated fifty times. Because if you listen to, let's say, the same uh, the same people over and over, sometimes they'll mention the same idea multiple times, same story. So maybe you'll remember it that way, but you're not going to remember it from yourself. You remember it because the rabbi repeated it fifty times. So I highly recommend people. Um, you know, uh, a uh, write down notes. Uh, okay, uh, when one goes up for an aliyah on Shabbat, is there a difference in level of reward or blessing for each different aliyah? Uh, you know, some chachamim say that there is certainly a significance in uh, the different aliyot. Uh, as far as the honor that the person gets from the community, uh, as far as the, uh, the reward they get in heaven, uh, I don't believe there's a difference. Uh, a person should go and, and have an aliyah once a month, uh, if it's possible for them. Uh, but uh, it's, it's certainly good for the neshama, it's even good for tikkun abrit to get an aliyah once a month. But uh, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the, the significance difference is really the honor of the community, meaning how it's viewed by the community itself. One, one second, let me get some. Okay, and uh, let's see, second question is, the Torah Psukim read by the Baal Kore, part of the blessing. Whatever is read can be a blessing to the one who goes up for the Aliyah. Uh, no, the, 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 uh, the, the verses that uh, are being read are really supposed to be read by the person that's getting the Aliyah. In the previous generations, uh, when people were much more learned than they are today, each person would read for themselves, meaning each aliyah, each person that would go up to the Torah would actually read 
the, their aliyah. Everybody knew how to read themselves. Uh, today, where most people don't know how to read from a Torah, uh, the, uh, the Baal Koi reads it on their behalf, but they're supposed to look at each verse uh, as they're reading it, uh, and if possible, you know, uh, say it with their lips, but not out loud, because it would bother the Baal Koi, but say it with their lips as if they're reading it. Uh, so uh, that's really what's supposed to be. So, so it's not a blessing. It's a fulfillment of the mitzvah of listening and reading the Torah. Uh, it's not a blessing. Uh, I know that there are some people that are, uh, I guess, sort of superstitious uh, where they don't want to have certain aliyot because it's talking about punishments and things like that, but that's, uh, uh, that has no foundation whatsoever. It's stupid. Uh, because every single verse in the Torah has the same value as the next. To say that one verse is more valuable than another is kfirah. In fact, this is the reason why the Rambam uh, writes that it is forbidden for people to stand up when the Ten Commandments uh, section of the Torah is being uh, read off, which is a, a horrible custom that was taken on by some communities over the years where they, uh, anytime uh, they got to the Torah portion where they would read the Ten Commandments, people would stand up. The Rambam writes that this is forbidden. Why? Because you are in essence saying that the verses of the Ten Commandments are more important than the rest of the Torah, which is false. You know, whether it's the verse of Bereshit Barai Lokim et HaShemayim it's the first verse of the Torah, or it's midvar sheker tichak from a thing of lies uh, stay away from. Or it's Hashem lachem lachem that uh, Exodus fourteen fourteen uh, God will fight your wars and you shall remain silent. Or it's the verses that talk about the sons of uh, of Cain. Or it's the uh, verses that talk about the korbanot. Or it's the any verse in the Torah. They all have the same exact value. To say that one verse has more value than another is not the right approach to say it nicely. Uh, and in reality, many Chachamim spoke harshly, uh, harshly against uh, people that think, uh, think uh, otherwise. Uh, what's Emuna? Uh, emuna is the belief that Hashem oversees everything that's happening in the world. Uh, every single detail and bitachon is confidence that he's uh, everything that he, which includes you obviously and bitachon is that everything that he's doing is the best option that you have available to you uh, obviously this is a oversimplification of these two very very important big terms in Torah uh, I would recommend anyone that wants to learn more extensively about emuna and bitachon uh, I believe one of the favorites of people of all time, as far as series that I've, I've done, and uh, certainly the Rabbanit's personal favorite is the series called Bitachon Be'ashem. Bitachon Be'ashem is a, uh, I think it's uh, 20 or so, 16 to 20 lectures uh, uh, that are based on the teachings of the Beta Levi. It's called Bitachon Be'ashem. That's the name of the series. If uh, you go to my YouTube channel or you go to uh, the app, it has a playlist. Watch all of those lectures. By the time you get out of that series, you're going to be a completely different person. Now, once you finish those, you're going to be elevated. You're going to want more. And the good news is we have more. After you finish that series, I always tell people, go directly to the Jewish Ashkafa series. The first 20 lectures are sort of a continuation and a deeper development of what was already built in those first 16 lectures in Bitachon Be'ashem. So you go, the entire series of Bitachon Be'ashem, finish that series, after that go to Jewish Ashkafa, the first 20 lectures are in essence the same subject, but uh, you know, deeper development of it, and of course continue after that with the Jewish Ashkafa even further, but the first 20 lectures are uh, specifically about the same subject of Emunah and Bitachon. How should a convert thank Hashem for his existence in the case in the case his father, a Jew, married a okay, you're, the screen keeps moving, sorry. No. There we go. 
When you guys type in more questions, the screen moves. Uh, okay. That question's gone. How... Um, if you have the ability to text it to me, text it to me, that question. Maybe I'll see it because the question is gone. Something about the convert thanking Hashem that is... Uh, father is a Jew, but his mom was a non-Jew. So how does he think about his existence? Is, I don't want to assume what the question is, but that's what I kind of think I read. All right, we'll wait to see if maybe I get it again. All right, next question. Uh, what is the meaning of Zvulun's spy being mentioned after Benjamin and not after Issachar? Uh, Zvulun spy being mentioned after Benjamin and not after Issachar. Uh, good question. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't remember reading anything about something. The difference. I mean the. Uh, uh, the tribes are not always mentioned in order. They're they're mentioned in different orders for different reasons. Uh, sometimes they're mentioned based on age. Sometimes they're mentioned based on position. Sometimes they're mentioned based on merit. Uh, sometimes they're uh, mentioned based on where they are as far as their position uh, in the camp. You know, the ones that were closest to the Mishkan, the ones that were in the front, the ones that were in the bar, in the back. Uh, so they they have different orders for different reasons. Uh, certainly, I don't know all of the uh, reasons off the uh, top of my head or everything. You'd have to read uh, commentary over there. Most likely, uh, you'll find something in uh, the Midrash uh, that could be talking about it. But uh, as far as that particular case, I don't know. Uh, are there specific tailing to say for certain situations or ailments? For example, someone who injured their foot, heel, ankle, or any other body part. Uh, yes, absolutely. There is a. Um, there's a set of tailing that. Of Pinchas Zavichi. Shechye, he actually put together. Uh, and he has in that Sefer Tailim, uh, in the, in the uh, beginning of it, he has a, uh, in English actually, uh, the Tilim are in, in Hebrew, but the uh, explanations are both in Hebrew and English. Uh, he has a uh, uh, different uh, sgulot that uh, in essence tell you which Tilim to read for which ailments or issues that a person has, whether a person is going to a court case or is having marriage problems, or is having uh, physical problems, or is having financial problems, or is about to meet somebody, or he wants people to like him, or he wants to win a lawsuit. Uh, literally, everything that a person pretty much would experience in their life, uh, there is a uh, in there. I have no idea uh, where you can buy it. I got it as a gift in Israel. But uh, the point is that this does exist. It does exist. Uh, 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 at times, people have asked me, and uh, I've used it to tell people uh, which Talim to read. Uh, generally speaking, you know, all Talim have uh, you know a uh, extraordinary value. I always recommend for people to, uh, especially for women, to make it a habit uh, where they complete the Sefer Talim regularly. Meaning, if you can't, you know, obviously most women can't read Talim all day, but if you could read five or ten Tehilim per day, that means that you will complete the entire Sefer Tehilim every two to four weeks. And you can simply read them in order. You know, you read, start with number one and, uh, and two and three and, and, and try to read five to ten of them each and every day. Uh, that way you'll complete the entire Sefer Tehilim uh, every two weeks, every uh, month. If uh, you have more time, uh, you know, on Shabbat, you know, some women read the entire Sefer Tehilim. Uh, my mother, God bless her, she, uh, uh, for many years, uh, she uh, reads the Sefer Tehilim and uh, completes it uh, during specific times of the year, during uh, the high holidays, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain uh, times of the year. She uh, sits there, it takes several hours. I think it takes like four hours or so for her to read the entire Sefer Tehilim. Uh, and this is very, very good for the neshama. It's good for men and for women. 
usually women have uh, you know more ability to do it, and if a man has four hours on his uh, you know uh, four hours to uh, to do something, he certainly should be learning Torah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he should never read Tehilim. He should read Tehilim. Reading Tehilim is very good for you. Um, but uh, as far as the specific things, uh, if someone has, uh, let's say, a unique situation, they want specific things, that uh, requires a little investigation. Like I told you, Rav Zavichi has something. I'm sure that there are other uh, Chachamim that have spoken about it over the years. I don't know who else, but this is one thing that I have, yes. Uh, Tehilim number 119, actually. Tehilim number 119 is the longest Tehilim. That one specifically, uh, each segment in it is about a different body part. Tehilim number 119. I'm in tears. The rabbi is right. Oh, Hashem. Torah is right. I'm just a little parrot that repeats what it says. Uh, should we put tzitzit on a newborn baby? Uh, I saw that they sell them in a Judaica store. A uh, newborn baby, not so much, no. Uh, once the uh, kid is a, uh, you know, uh, is a little older, uh, you know, I, uh, they're able to, uh, uh, you know, you know, walk, and you know, then certainly putting a tzitzit on them would be good. But uh, when they're an infant, I think it could be more trouble than it's worth uh, and could actually even be dangerous because, you know, most of the times, the, you know, tzitzit can move or whatever. But, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, put it on a baby. I would put it on uh, uh, kids that are a little older. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but not, not a newborn baby. As far as what they sell in Judaica store, in the Judaica store, they sell anything that people are going to buy. Don't assume that just because somebody's selling it, that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, you know, in the Judaica stores, the, they uh, sell a lot of things there, and uh, many times you shouldn't buy any, you know, uh, buy them at all. How do you make rev rebellious children or those off the derech who most likely ended up that way due to childhood trauma or some emotional and mental issues? Uh, obviously, it has to be uh, by a case-by-case basis. It depends what the trauma is. It depends uh, what the uh, health issue is. It depends on what their thought process is. It depends on uh, how they uh, communicate. Uh, it depends how much time you have. There's certainly no way to uh, give a one-size-fits-all for something like that. You know, people that are... Uh, you know, uh, traumatized are a, uh, you know, it's uh, require an enormous amount of uh, attention, which they deserve because, you know, you want to help them. Uh, but not everybody can do it. And not necessarily uh, everybody that can do it really should do it because not, you know, not everybody has that skill set because it requires a, uh, you know, unique skill sets and uh, extraordinary patience. Extraordinary patience and very, very, uh, you know, cool temperament. Uh, in so many words, people would never get angry, you know. But if a person finds themselves, you know, getting angry or frustrated by stuff, they, you know, they should find an expert to do it. But uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not the same way as you would deal with somebody that's, uh, you know, normal. Uh, Rabbi, if someone has more merits than... Demerits, you mean sins? Can they go to heaven instead of Gainom? For example, let's say Manus, YY, and friends speak some heresy, but uh, the other 90% they do is good and they make a bala tshuva. Uh, future generation, no, okay, so the way it works is this there's no such the, the uh, uh, important thing for, for a person to know. One of the 13 principles of faith is that. Hashem rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Now, what does that mean? That means that the mitzvot do not erase the sins. And the sins don't erase the mitzvot. Each one has to be dealt with separately. So when a person dies, you know, they go through the chibut kevel. After they finish that, based on what type of klipa they have, uh, what kind of sins they've made, what kind of, you know, addictions they have, physical addictions, 
mental addictions and so on. They finish that section, they go to the Bedin of Shemaim, and the first thing that they have to deal with is their sins. First, they have to deal with their sins, not their mitzvot. Their mitzvot are not even considered at first. The first thing that's considered is all of their sins. Why? You can't enter Gan Eden with all of the filth that you've collected throughout the whole life. So a person has to deal with the sins. If the person has a certain amount of uh, sins, let's say they uh, forgot to make a blessing here and there, they, uh, maybe they uh, were uh, not polite, they uh, said, used some foul language, whatever, they did some, uh, some things here and there, fine. So those sins have to be dealt with. But if they did some bigger sins, for example, if they you know, uh, didn't keep Shabbat, uh, you know, uh, they died a Mechalel Shabbat, then that's it. That's that's the end. There's no, there's no, there, there, the, the mitzvot that they have were already, they were already rewarded for them, in uh, in, in in the world. You know, if they if they die mechel shabbat, they're they're in a category of a person that goes to Gainom forever. If they waste seed and never do tshuva for it, they go to Gainom forever. If they're uh, never never put on tefillin, uh, they go to Gainom forever. So there's certain cal- there's certain types of sins that this is the end. Most sins are not that way. Uh, you know, but uh, certainly they deserve a certain uh, type of punishment. Sometimes, sometimes the punishment will have to be in Gehenom, in different chambers. Sometimes it'll have to be in Kafakela. Sometimes it'll have to be reincarnation. Sometimes it'll be a combination thereof, where for a certain part of the sin, he has to suffer in Chibut Kevel. Another part of the sin, he has to suffer in uh, Kafakela for uh, a few hundred years then after that he has to go back to the Bedin of Shemaim. Then they say, okay, so now you finish with this sin, you have to go to the next one, you have to go and reincarnate. Reincarnate as a person again. Live life, come back upstairs, hopefully not in worse condition, and after he fix that particular sin, and they uh, then go to the next one. And the next sin, next sin has to go and uh, be rectified in Gehenom, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Gan Eden is, is, is not happening just because he did good things. First, he has to deal with the bad things. Now, if a person caused people to go against the Shem, if a person preached things that are heretical uh, uh, against the Shem, against the Torah, uh, not just by accident, but as a shita, as a shita, meaning that was their strategy, they have no share of the world to come. Meaning, it doesn't matter what good they did. They could have given a billion dollars to some yeshiva that had Gdola Dog grow up there. It's not going to help them. If they literally destroyed the lives of a lineage of people uh, because they taught them that, uh, you know, that uh, they could serve a man or that uh, God is a man or that God need, oh, needs you, all types of uh, foolish things, uh, then they, they're Machtia Rabin. And the uh, the um, uh, Rambam says people that are machtia rabim have no share of the world to come. This is in Ilchot uh, uh, in the Rambam. So uh, there is no such thing as a golden ticket to Gan Eden just because somebody did good things. If they do good things, but the bad things that they do are uh, you know the worst type, then they'll get rewarded for those bad things in this world. And on that, the verse in Parashat Vayitchanan says Meshalem el Sonav el Panav Lavido. Hashem rewards his haters to their face, meaning in this world, in order to destroy them. This is the uh, second to last verse in Parashat Vayet Hanan. Can one blow out candles on Shabbat if leaving the house for safety reasons? No. Not allowed to turn on fire, not allowed to uh, uh, turn off fire. No. Tchilul Shabbat. Uh, with uh, so many companies celebrating Gaava month, it seems difficult to boycott them all. I was looking at jobs on LinkedIn and many changed their logos to rainbow colors. How do we navigate this issue? Uh, you navigate it by simply getting a job at a company that is, uh, you know, a company that functions there. They may, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to discern between 
are they promoting homosexuality because that's the type of behavior they want in their company or they're just simply, you know, being socialites where they're simply trying to be accepted by society. Meaning most companies, they're not, you know, uh, LGBTQ companies, meaning that they're not a, uh, uh, you know, where your every second employee is one of these people and they're even looking for these types of people and they're even trying to influence people to be like them. Most companies are not like that. Most companies are regular businesses, but for the sake of appealing to a, uh, a marketplace, marketplace being those abomination people, uh, they uh, appeal to them by having the flag and having the, uh, you know, being participating in this stupidity. So I would not boycott them just because they're participating uh, in having the, their logo change or they're having a T-shirt or any of those stupid things. Because uh, if you're going to do that, you're going to simply boycott every company on the, you know, on the, in the world. Uh, so now it all depends on how does the company actually function? What do they do? Uh, if it's, let's say, for example, a, uh, a company like, a, uh, I don't know, let's say... Um, uh, Coca-Cola, okay? Coca-Cola, uh, whether it's going to join the uh, Pride Month uh, parades or not, it's Coca-Cola is going to remain the same. You know, the, the, the drink, the, the product itself is never going to change, okay? It has been the same uh, since they took out the cocaine out of it. It's going to remain the same where they replace cocaine with sugar, so one drug to another. But needless to say, the product is staying the same whether there's a uh, LGBTQ scientist or not. On the other hand, a company like Disney, where their product is preaching LGBTQ, them you have to boycott. Why? Because them, it's not just certain employees, it's the product itself. It's the mentality itself. So there's a difference between the two. There's a difference between the two. And I would do the same thing, not just for LGBTQ, but for other things. If, let's say, for example, uh, the uh, somebody... Uh, uh, you know, joins also, I don't know, the, the, the Black History Month, okay? Now, with all due respect to all the wonderful black people, uh, I don't necessarily think that, uh, you know, it's a uh, ideal for every single person in every company to be part of Black History Month. Why? Some of them may not necessarily care for, for black people. Some of them don't necessarily dislike uh, uh, black people, but they don't necessarily want to, you know, wear a shirt or have uh, their email, or have uh, their, uh, whatever, different parts of their uh, day-to-day -day life have to do with this holiday or, or this memorization, uh, you know, because they have no connection to it. They're from China. Just like not everybody wants to celebrate or, or commemorate Holocaust. You know, so, you know, so again, is it a company that is promoting uh, this just as a marketing scheme, or is it them? Is it them? So there is, for example, there's this a uh, 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 new thing called uh, black excellence, and black excellence, a certain part of it is certainly very good. Why? Because it is encouraging uh, black people to uh, better themselves. Simply put, to better themselves, to uh, get out of whatever. Uh, uh, life they were in, uh, whatever uh, 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 you know, issues they had, whatever problems they have to overcome, and better themselves, you know, by by doing the best they can in whatever they're doing, not just uh, the, the the stereotypical professions of of athletics and 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 uh, and celebrity, but rather the, the everyday, you know, legal, real estate, medicine, uh, marketing, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, and so on. And really, the, the whole thing is, is to try to uh, improve your status in the world, which is a fantastic thing that should have happened longer ago, not just now. Now, this, the concept itself of encouraging a community, whether they're black people or Hindus or Jews or, 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 or Asians or whoever, to better themselves is, in general, is a fantastic idea. And in fact... It's a uh, even helping each other out where in the community there is a, uh, let's say in a Jewish community, there's a bunch of Jews having their businesses there. In the black community, there's a bunch of black people that helping having their businesses there. In the Hindi community, there's a bunch of Hindus helping each other, you know, having their business there. This is perfectly fine, normal and good and healthy. 
What's not good is when they take it too far where they simply boycott everyone else. Where they say, listen, you know, uh, if you're really a, a part of the, uh, the, the, the black excellence uh, uh, movement or theology or idea, uh, then uh, you're going to simply be part of this one particular uh, activist that says, don't buy anything that's not black made. Meaning, if you're going to buy a, a toothbrush, only buy a toothbrush that black people manufactured. If you're going to buy a, uh, uh, a uh, sneakers, only buy sneakers from, uh, you know, uh, now, and there's even websites that literally, they're, they're like uh, what they call, I think, the Black Amazon or something like that, or at least that's the, uh, in essence, the way they, uh, they talk about it, where it's a guy that has like a store, an online store, where he is, in essence, promoting all of the companies uh, that are selling uh, uh, products that are owned by black people. So it's sort of like, say, like Amazon, you know, but it's all the companies on that platform are black owned. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, that's perfectly fine. What's wrong with, 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 with the idea is when somebody says, only use this and never use anything else. Meaning, don't buy rice from the Middle Eastern people or the people from India because they're not black. Uh, don't buy, uh, you know, uh, milk from uh, such and such because they're not black. Uh, it, that's not good. That's not good. I'm not talking about, this has nothing to do with religion. This has to do with generally just the civilized society because that breeds racism. That's not, that's not excellence. That's going back. That's going back to how things used to be just, you know, in, in a diff different way. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's important for people to know that uh, it, before you boycott anyone, before you uh, disassociate with anyone, you have to put a little bit of thought to it and, and understand what are you really boycotting? What are you really boycotting? And it's a, in reality, many times when people boycott and, they, and they, they're, they're just hurting themselves and they're hurting society, no one benefits from it. No one benefits from boycotting. You know, it's a, uh, it's a ridiculous thing. Because even if somebody wanted to, uh, let's say, this BDS movement, the Machshimam, where it's uh, the boycotting the stuff from Israel and Jews and so on, there's really no way to do it. There's no way that that plan could ever actually work. Why? Because if you're using technology today, any type of technology today, you have to use uh, Israeli-made products. You have to use products that are, that are made by people that are pro-Israel, that are part of Israel, and so on and so forth. So... It's, it's ridiculous that, 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 that people are following these types of things and supporting them and funding them with billions of dollars when in reality all they're doing is destroying parts of society while at the same time lining the pockets of the chief racists, the chief uh, 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 you know, people that are uh, the biggest hypocrites. So if... You want to help your fellow black people, Hindi people, Jewish people, Arab people, whatever people you're from, that's perfectly fine. But don't tell me I'm only going to do business with them and to the, to the point where you're going to jeopardize the safety and the well-being of, you know, of, of your community, your health, and the public's uh, uh, safety and rest uh, and health. Just for that, just just for to save, you know, to do uh, 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 this type. Of, it's just it's not going to help anybody. So, boycotting again uh, is a. Uh, it all depends on what's be, what's under the wheel. What, what's under the wheel? You know, I, I saw some great things uh, in a documentary uh, about what's happening in uh, certain communities. Some horrible things that's happening in other communities. Uh, and uh, the truth is, is that it's all about who's the leaders. And what do they believe? What do they believe? If they believe that uh, you know they uh, you know that they should try to help each other, that's good. That's normal. That's uh, perfectly uh, acceptable and and and, uh, and and healthy for every community to help itself in order for for them to uh, strengthen themselves and grow and and do better. Uh, but if they simply say you know everybody die. And, 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 and for us to live type of mentality or let everyone go to hell uh, and, and we're going to go to heaven type of mentality, that's not a uh, Torah mentality. That's not a healthy mentality. That is a, uh, a dangerous mentality. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, and, and even with, with the uh, uh, things that are against the Torah, for example, uh, 
uh, such as this abomination of LGBTQ. We call it an abomination not because we have anything uh, personally against the people, but rather because that's what God calls it. That's what God calls that behavior. But that doesn't mean that if you see one of those people, you could hurt them physically in some way, or you're allowed to steal from them or cheat them or, or, or publicly uh, disgrace them. No, simple. You know, this is an abomination for Torah Jews. This is not something that we practice. This is not something that we, uh, we accept. This is not something that uh, uh, we want as, as, as part of our uh, teachings in our communities. But for them to have their own island or something or whatever, their own world, I don't know, Manhattan is an island. So there's a lot of them there. There's a lot of uh, uh, them in San Francisco. There's a lot of them everywhere these days. But the point is for them to go and live their life, we care less. Let them do whatever they want. The problem is that that doesn't work that way because their mentality is the same thing as the missionary mentality, which is that they can't coexist. They, they don't want to live on their own. They don't want to have like an LGBTQ country and uh, you know, they want to have LGBTQ world. They want everybody to be like them. That's why they are you know, uh, uh, doing, t- trying to infiltrate or s- in succeeding, unfortunately, into kindergartens, into grade schools, into uh, high schools, into colleges. And they're doing literally everything possible to get into the education system because they want to turn it into a world. N- not very different than how, you know, uh, uh, Christianity uh, was and is to a certain extent where they cannot exist with the uh, Jewish people while the Jewish people remain Jewish, they uh, are, their goal is always to, uh, you know, uh, convert all the Jews to their idolatry. So if they all wanted to go on, you know, one end of the world and we go on another end of the world, no problem. If we can even be next door neighbors, no problem. But the problem is they don't want to do that. They want to infiltrate. So that's, that's the, you know, that, that, that's the mentality difference. If a person mistreated a child, will they need to apologize to the child, mom, and dad, or just the child? What if the person apologized to the mom, but not to the dad, because he might act out? Uh, it all depends on what happened to the child and what kind of mistreatment. If, let's say, they, uh, uh, it's a Jew, uh, and uh, he, the child, let's say, was uh, eight years old, and uh, let's say an adult uh, embarrassed him. Uh, he could do what the stipler Gaon did, which is wait until the child is uh, uh, certainly apologize at that time, apologize at that time, but then wait until the child is 13 years old if it's a boy, 12 years old and they're, if they're a girl, and then go back to them at that age because that's when they're considered uh, adults and they could really forgive you by apologizing again. That's what the stipler Gaon did when he thought that he insulted a... Uh, uh, a eight or nine year old kid uh, and he waited until the kid grew up uh, was bar mitzvah and he attended his bar mitzvah just for the sake of apologizing to him uh, that's the way of G'dolei Israel. What is the difference of, is there a difference between the spirit of the law and the law? Uh, You're talking about the essence, the essence of the Torah and the Torah. Uh, So what we have in the world today is the essence of the Torah, and the Torah itself is is, is greater than what we have in the world. It's it's not possible for human beings to learn it. That's uh, why when people, uh, for example... That's why when people, for example... uh, uh, ask what do uh, why do people uh, learn Torah? Sadikim learn Torah in Shemaim. Someone is calling me and it's taking down my camera. One second. I have to. So you get yourself blocked. 
so the um, so people ask what why do tzaddikim learn Torah in Gan Eden if they have learned Torah throughout their uh, their life. Uh, you know why do they need to learn it? What, you know all because the Torah that you have in this world is not all of the Torah. It's the essence of the Torah. It's the essence of the Torah. The the uh, the whole Torah is not. It's, it's beyond this world. Uh, the, what we got at Mount Sinai is the essence of the Torah, but the, the Torah is much much greater than this world can handle. Okay, last question, and then we're going. Uh, Uh, does Nivul Peh apply to derogatory slurs meant for the wicked? Uh, no, if you are insulting the wicked, as long as it's not, uh, you know, things that are forbidden words. Uh, this way, if it's a word that's mentioned in a Torah, it's permitted. You know, sometimes people that, uh, you know, that watch, uh, they ask me, how do you curse in your lectures. I said, me curse in my lectures? Absolutely not. I never curse in my lectures. Like, no, you said the word zonot. I said, that's not a curse. That's a word in the Torah. You may think of it as a curse because that's the, uh, 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 the, the mentality that people have, but it's not a curse. It's, it's a word that's in the Torah. Uh, it's in so many words, the status of a person that acts a certain way or did certain things. So it's a, uh, if, if it's a word that's in a Torah, you're allowed to say it. Uh, if it's not a word, that's, uh, if it's not in a Torah, then obviously you should double check if you're allowed to say it or not. Um, Screen keeps moving. All right, for ones that start with 15 minutes of learning a day, what do you recommend a time frame for the intervals leveling up as the years go by? Um, well, you go from 15 minutes to a half hour, half hour to, you know, try to go from a half hour to an hour. And then after an hour, try to go from, you know, an hour to an hour and a half, two hours. It all depends on a person, really. Uh, it all depends on what they do, if they are working, if they have a lot of free time. Uh, each person, you know, should know that if, they're, uh, uh, if they want to have any chance whatsoever of, of, of you know, doing tshuva and, and, and eventually putting themselves in a good position... Uh, not just in you know heaven, but in this world, they have to learn a couple of hours a day. They have to learn a couple of hours a day. It's not as a uh, you know if, if a person thinks they're going to get by for the rest of their life with 15, 20 minutes, it's not. It's 15, 20 minutes. That's just to get started. But the goal is to get to at least a, you know a few hours a day. Uh, but uh, even if a person can't do four, five, six hours a day, certainly they can do a couple of hours a day. If they're learning less than a couple of hours a day. Their their situation is very dire. Can a Kohen adopt a child since his adopted child will not be a Kohen? Uh, yeah, there's no problem with an adopting child. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, this is two and a half hours. I need to get some rest. I have another shiur in Hebrew coming up later. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys got some chizuk out of it I know I did uh, certainly enjoyed this year I enjoyed the uh, uh, questions Hashem bless each and every single one of you uh, please anyone that uh, can donate uh, go to the websites bezotashem.org or bhtorah.org or if you want to do any tikkunim to purify your neshama from immorality uh, go to tikkunablit.live uh, sign up for uh, maybe a monthly uh, type of donation uh, to do a once a month uh, type of tikkun uh, or if you want to sponsor one of our avrichim uh, at our kolel for a week out of the month a month you know or an entire month depending on your financial condition 
uh, please go to the websites. There's plenty of opportunities to, uh, to join us and all the amazing things that the organization does. Uh, and Baruch uh, Hashem, we, uh, we do whatever we can to help as many people as we can, uh, as long as we know that they're all uh, you know, in a, uh, on the same page and trying to serve a Kaddosh Baruch Hu. Baruch and Bezal Hashem, we will uh, speak soon.